My name is Rick Renner, and today I'm in the conference room at the Moscow Good News Church in Moscow, Russia. Can you imagine? This is Moscow, Russia, where God is pouring His Spirit out on hungry hearts. God will pour His Spirit out on anyone who wants to be filled with the Spirit. God wants to pour His Spirit out where you are. But the people in this room are studying the Bible, and actually they're listening to me right now on television as I discuss the will of God and how to know the will of God for your life. God has a will for you. Some people say, well, there's the good will of God, there's the permissive will of God. Are you sure? Does the Bible really say there's such a thing as the permissive will of God? I don't think so. That's really an error. God just has a good will for you. God has a perfect will for you. And my friend, when you step into the will of God, your life will suddenly become full color. Everything comes alive when you finally get in the will of God. And according to Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, you have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What does that mean, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind? One thing is sure, the verse says, you'll never know the perfect will of God until you get your mind in shape to hear it. So you have to know how to do that. And that is what I'm going to talk to you about today. This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to today's program. I've been waiting for you. We're talking about knowing the will of God. When you find the will of God, your life will suddenly wake up. You'll feel like you've stepped into a full color spectrum when you finally hear what God wants you to do and you step into it. You will step out of a black and white world into a full color world. And I know that you're waiting for that. And God is waiting for that for you. God wants you to step into the most marvelous, sensational, adventure-filled life. He is just waiting for you to get your mind renewed and to surrender yourself so that you can find out his plan for your life. And that's what I'm talking to you about this week. And if you need someone to pray with you about the will of God, or about any decision you're facing, or anything that is on your heart, let us pray with you. Just call the number that's on the screen, or send us an email, and as soon as we hear from you, we will begin to put our faith together with you. Jesus said that if any two of you would agree as touching anything, he would do it, and if you'll contact us, we'll agree with you, and Jesus will do what he said he will do. He will move on your behalf. Just call us or write us, and we will immediately begin to pray with you, and God will work on your behalf. I believe that. And today we're offering you my series, which is called Knowing the Will of God. It's five parts. It comes in multiple formats. This is just packed, really rich teaching about surrendering ourselves and hearing what God has to say to us and stepping into God's plan. It's really wonderful. It comes in multiple formats. You can order it right now online, and it comes with a study guide. The two of these together are just dynamite. We're also right now offering you my book called The Will of God, The Key to Your Success. The back of the book says, are you ready for a life filled with adventure? That's what you have when you step into the will of God. You begin to experience an adventure in life. If you feel things are a little monotonous and boring, then just step into the will of God and suddenly the monotony will leave. You'll find your life filled with adventure. You say, well, how do I do it? That's what this book is about. And I want you to order your copy right now. This is a book that you'll be glad you have. And maybe you should order a couple so you can give one to a friend. Also, for those who become partners, a partner is somebody who financially supports our ministry on a regular basis so we can take this teaching to people all over the world. This program doesn't just come to you. It's going to people in multiple languages, people that are just starving for the verse-by-verse -verse teaching of the Bible. And God has given me the assignment to bring that teaching to people that are spiritually famished. And when you become a partner, 
you help us do that. And we'll immediately send you a package of books as our way of saying thank you for becoming a partner with our ministry. But today, we're going to return to our subject of knowing the will of God. And I want to begin today how I began the first in this series. You will never know the will of God until you lay aside your own will. As long as your own will is in the picture, the waters are going to be muddied. It's going to be very difficult for you to hear what God really wants you to do. I understand this because I've had to come to moments in my life when I've had to lay aside my own will so that I could hear what God had to say. God wants to speak clearly to us. But if we've got our own ideas or our own will or our own plans, sometimes it's hard for us to hear the will of God. So we have to be willing to lay it all aside and say, God, our ears are open to hear whatever you have to say to us, and we have a heart to obey. And if we have a heart to obey, and if we're willing to hear, God will speak to us, and he will reveal his plan to us for our life, for our marriage, for our finances, for what church we should attend, for what kind of job we ought to have, what we ought to do in the ministry. Listen, Sometimes people say, well, God works in strange and mysterious ways. Well, not really. If you study scripture, you find that God is very habitual in the way that he works. And if you'll just clear your mind to hear, and if you'll let the will of God, the voice of God and scripture be the dominant voice in your life above every other voice, above your opinions, above your ideas, above your feelings, if you'll let the voice of God be dominant in your life, you will hear God speak to you and God will reveal his plan to you. Now, I've got my Bible and today we're going to return to Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 and we're going to quickly move on to the end of the verse. But when we come to Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, Paul is writing and he gives us two verses which may be the best verses in the New Testament about knowing the will of God. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and verse 2. But today we're going to finish verse 1. And he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Today, we're going to be focusing on those words, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. What does that mean? But first, we're going to begin at the first of verse one, again, where Paul says, I beseech you. This word beseech, the Greek word parakaleo, which is a compound of two words. The word para means alongside. This tells us right up front, when Paul writes this verse, he's drawing near to me. He's drawing near to you. He's coming as close as he can get. The second part of the word is the word kaleo, which means to call or to beseech. But when you put the two words together, it forms the word parakaleu, which points the picture of somebody that is beseeching, somebody that is urging, pleading, begging, even praying. One expositor says it's a picture of the great legendary apostle dropping to his knees. He is so sincere when he's writing this verse. He's calling out to us, drawing near to us, pleading with us, begging us, praying us. But this word parakaleo was also importantly a military term. And this is very important in this verse because it depicted military leaders who came alongside their troops to urge, exhort, beseech, beg, plead with them to stand tall, throw their shoulders back and face their battles bravely. Paul is about to ask you and me to do something which may thrust us into warfare. He's going to ask us to present our bodies, to present our minds, our emotions, everything we are as a living sacrifice. And when we begin the process of presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice to hear the will of God and do the will of God, sometimes our flesh argues, our will struggles. And Paul says, listen, You better face this battle bravely because this will thrust you into spiritual warfare. Throw your shoulders back, hold your head high and decide you are going to win this battle and you're going to present yourself as a living sacrifice. The word present is the Greek word par istomi. And we've seen this in the previous programs. It means to officially dedicate. It is the same word which is used in Luke 2 Verse 22, where the Bible tells us that Mary and Joseph, after the days of Mary's purification was finished, they brought Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. It's the very same Greek word, the word 
par estimé. It means to present, to fully dedicate, with no intention of ever taking back again. An official offering to put at someone's disposal. So when they presented Jesus to the Lord, they said, Lord, this child is yours. We're putting him at your disposal. He is yours for your plans, for your purposes. We will never take him back again. This is a once in a lifetime permanent commitment. We are finally right now giving him to you. He is at your disposal. That's what Mary and Joseph did when they presented Jesus. Now, Paul borrows the very same word. And he says that we are to present our bodies in the same way they presented Jesus to the Lord to be at God's disposal. We are to present our body to the Lord and to say, Lord, our body, our mind, our will, our emotions, everything that we are, we're presenting it to you once and for all to never take it back again. We are yours. We are at your disposal. We are dedicated fully to you. Paul tells us to do that. And if you want to know the will of God, that's the first step. That is God's requirement. But wait, what else does he say in this verse? He says, present your bodies a living sacrifice. The word living is a form of the Greek word zao, which means to be living, to be lively, or to be vibrant. It could be translated a vibrant sacrifice. But the word sacrifice is from the Greek word thuo. You don't usually think of the word sacrifice as being vibrant. It's the word sacrifice. This word thuo, here translated sacrifice, means to sacrifice. But originally, it referred to the sacrificial slaughter of animals on the altar. This is a very ugly thing. It meant to surrender or to give up something that is precious and dear. Well, remember that Paul was writing to former pagans, and as former pagans, they had all grown up in pagan temples where sacrifices were regularly offered every day in pagan temples. They all knew this word sacrifice, the word thuo, because it was a part of their upbringing before they came to Christ. And so I want to again give you today the anatomy of, of a sacrifice. Every reader, when they saw this word sacrifice, saw all of this because it was the world they grew up in. This word thuo, the word sacrifice, depicted one of the most momentous times in the life of a pagan. When you brought a sacrifice to the gods, it was a very big moment in your life. It was festive, it was public, it was a celebration. Now, there were also private sacrifices which you could conduct every day in your home. And in fact, if you were a good pagan, you had a small altar in your home where every day in the privacy of your home, when nobody was looking, you could also offer a sacrifice. But first you began with a big sacrifice. It was public. It was festive. It was celebrative. Then every day in your home, you would reaffirm your commitment by offering a daily sacrifice. But when they brought these animals to the altar to be sacrificed, they decorated the animals. They painted the horns of the beast. They put wine and barley on the back of the beast. It was very, very festive. And they would walk the beast up the steps toward the front of the temple to the altar. And then they would lay the neck of the beast on the altar. They would slit the neck of the animal. The blood would begin to pour out and they would collect all the blood into a bowl, which they then would pour all over the altar with wine and with other things. Then they would start a fire and the fire would begin to consume the blood and consume the wine. Then they would take the dead animal and they would cut it into pieces and they would burn it until it was completely consumed. Listen careful. If there was no death, then there was no sacrifice. Death and blood were required for a sacrifice or it was not a sacrifice. If you walked off with a living animal, then all you had was a spectacle. You did not have a sacrifice. It wasn't real unless something died. All of that is in this word sacrifice, the Greek word thuo. By using this word, Paul tells us that we are to be living sacrifices. We're to present ourselves to the Lord publicly. It's to be celebrated. It's to be festive. This should be a grand occasion in our life when we celebrate the giving of ourselves to God. And on a daily basis, we need to regularly redo it every day in the privacy of our prayer time in our homes as we reconfirm to the Lord every single day when we wake up 
or some point in the day, Lord, here I am again. I'm reconfirming that I have given myself to you. So we find an initial public giving, a private daily reaffirmation. That's why Paul calls it a living sacrifice. God is calling on me and God is calling on you every day of our life to come back on the altar as a living, vibrant, lively sacrifice, surrendering ourselves to the plans and to the purposes of God. It can be done publicly. That's what happens when we get saved. It can be done privately as we recommit every day of our lives. But we can never take our lives back into our own hands once we have become a living sacrifice. And again, if there's been no death, there's been no sacrifice. Well, God's not calling on physical death. He's calling us to die to ourselves. Like Jesus said in Matthew 16, 25, when you lose your life for Jesus' sake, you'll find it. We are to lose our life or we are to surrender ourselves to the plans and to the purposes of God. And Paul says in verse 1, if we do that, we will become holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. The word holy is a translation of the Greek word hagias. This word hagias is the primary word for the word holy in the entire Bible. The word hagias describes something that is holy, something that is consecrated, it is different, it is separate, it is consecrated. When we present ourselves to the Lord like I'm describing to you today, God says, while that is special, that is holy, this is a different thing, this is a different act, this is consecrated, and suddenly we place ourselves in a totally different category. You see, there are believers that are surrendered and there are believers that are not surrendered. There are believers living for themselves, living for their own plans, their own ideas. But when you surrender yourself fully to the plan of God and determine to never take yourself back into your own hands again, suddenly you enter into a new category. This is holy. This is separate. This is consecrated. This is really special. That's how God views this kind of surrender. In fact, Paul goes on to say it is acceptable unto God. That is just amazing because the word acceptable is the Greek word you, aristos. It's a compound of the word you and the Greek word arisko. The word you describes something that is well, something that is done well, something that is even swell, something that is good, correct, or right. The word arisko carries the idea of delight, something that is filled with joy, something that is virtuous. But when you compound the two words together, the word you and the word arisko, they form the Greek word euaristos, which portrays something that is exceedingly pleasing and pleasurable, something that is way over the top in terms of the pleasure that it brings it depicts a sacrifice that is fully pleasing or an event that brings God pleasure. That's what it means. So when we crawl up on the altar every day and say, Jesus, here I am again. I'm yours today, Lord. From this moment forward, every moment of this day, I'm here to do your will, to do your pleasure. I'm your servant. I'm here to do your bidding. God says, first of all, that is holy. This is really special. This is unique. This is a holy moment. Secondly, the Greek word, euerostos, means God says this is way over the top in terms of the pleasure it brings to him. When we really present ourselves to the Lord, it brings great delight to the Lord. But then Paul goes on to say this is our reasonable service. What does that mean? Reasonable service is a Greek phrase, logikin latreon, from the word logikas and the word latreia, the word logikas is where we get the word for reason or logic. The word latreia is the word for the priesthood. Let me read to you from my notes. The word logikas means rational, logical, or that which agrees with reason. The word latreia, the second part of this phrase, depicts priestly ministry and all the services rendered by those who are in the priesthood. This phrase together depicts the rational, logical, expected service that should be provided by anyone in the priesthood. Thus, it is the anticipated and expected behavior of any believer who has yielded himself as a living sacrifice. This is logical priestly function, full-time function, a lifelong occupation, or Paul says, 
This is the kind of priesthood that God expects you to live in and to perform. And it is logical. It is reasonable. After all that God has done for you, after Jesus shed his blood, after God has extended redemption and forgiveness to you, after God has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit and the word of God and placed us in the church, all the grace of God that has been poured out in our life, Paul writes, it is logican, logical, Latrean priesthood. This should be expected of any believer who claims that he has surrendered himself. This is logical. This is your lifelong occupation is to live as a sacrifice. Now, you're going to serve somebody. You're going to serve yourself. You're going to serve somebody else. You're going to serve sin. You're going to serve righteousness. You're going to serve God. You're going to serve somebody. That is why Joshua chapter 24 verse 15 says, choose you this day who you're going to serve. You're going to serve somebody. You might as well choose that you're going to serve God with your life. Now, as long as you have your own will, it will be very difficult for you to ever find the will of God. As long as you have your own plans, you probably won't find God's plan. And by the way, your plan and God's plan may be the same. They may not. But you're never going to know unless you surrender your plans and open your ears and say, Hey, God, here I am. I'm presenting myself, pirates to me, officially placing myself at your disposal. I'm making a once and for all dedication, never taking myself back again, a living sacrifice. I'm crawling up on the altar. I'm dying to any of my own plans and my own ideas. I'm surrendering myself fully to you. And God says, That is holy. That is awesome. That is special. That is well-pleasing. That brings me incredible delight. And finally, Paul says, it is your reasonable service as a priest, as one redeemed. This is what God expects of you. And God is expecting us to live as surrendered people for the rest of our life. And when we come back in the next program, we're going to come to verse 2, where we find that when we really surrender our minds, our minds become so renewed that we're able to hear the will of God. The will of God is no longer difficult. When you've really renewed your mind, your mind is able to grasp deep things. Your mind is even able to grasp mysteries. When your mind has been renewed, suddenly you're able to prove what is that good and perfect will of God. That's what we're going to see when we come back. But in just a moment, I'm going to pray for you. Can you really know the will of God for your life? God has a plan explicitly formed just for you. But what does God require before He opens your mind to comprehend it? What steps do you need to take to get into a place where you can actually see God's will and begin to implement it? If you're saying, I want to know this will of God for my life, then knowing the will of God is what you need to put you on the right path. In this five-part series, you'll learn how to find God's will, how to know if you're on or off track, whether there is a permissible will of God as opposed to the perfect will of God. Available in digital or physical formats starting at just $10, you'll learn how to know God's will for your life and how to get started doing it. In addition to this teaching series, you can also purchase the book, The Will of God, The Key to Your Success. In this book, Rick will show you step-by-step step how to find God's will and get started on the path to fulfill it. It's really not so hard. And as you read this powerful book, Rick will help you know how to begin living a life filled with adventure. The Will of God, The Key to Your Success can be yours for only $17. Don't miss this special offer, Knowing the Will of God and the Will of God, the Key to Your Success. Call now or go to renner.org. Call or go online now. We welcome everybody online. <laughs>
We're talking about knowing the will of God. Do you want to know the will of God? Do you want to really wake up to what God wants you to do with your life? Are you tired of just taking a shot in the dark and wasting time, making mistakes? You'd like to really zero in on what God wants to do for you. You can know the will of God. That's why I'm teaching you this series. And when we come back tomorrow, we're going to see what we have to do to renew our minds so we can really distinctly hear God's exact plan for me and for you. You really can hear it if you will renew your mind. I want you to order my series called Knowing the Will of God, a five-part series that comes in multiple formats. It is just loaded with revelation that will help you know the will of God. Or maybe you know somebody that's trying to find the will of God. This will be a great gift to give them. And it comes with a marvelous study guide. We're also offering you right now my book called The Will of God, The Key to Your Success. The back of the book says, Are you ready for a life filled with adventure? A life filled with adventure is waiting for you, but you have to embrace it and step into it. And I want to tell you that if you need prayer today, we're here for you. Oh, how we want to pray with you. If you'll just contact us, there's a wonderful voice waiting to take your call right now. Or if you'll send us an email, as soon as your email shows up in our inbox, we will begin to pray for you. We will answer you. And I promise you, we will keep praying with you because we are serious about praying for you and for whatever is on your heart. But I want to pray for you right now. Father, thank you for Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Thank you that you want us to present ourselves as a living sacrifice and that when we do, that is good, that is pleasurable, and it is the reasonable thing you expect us to do after all you have done for us. Help us, Lord, to be good priests. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, when we come back tomorrow, we're finally going to get to Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, and it's going to be awesome. So be sure to join me here tomorrow. But until then, I want you to remember Ecclesiastes 8 verse 4. It says, where the word of a king is, there's power. I quote it every day because I believe it. God's word has power. Let it release its power in you today, and I'll see you tomorrow. This program was made possible by the giving of the God-called partners of Renner Ministries.